All right, in this video, we're talking about composite functions. Composite functions from that VCE math methods, fun stuff. Now, composite functions, what the hell are they? Who invented them? What kind of crazy person would ever think about composite functions? I don't know, I don't have the answers. If I was a mathematician, I wouldn't be dumb enough to do composite functions, but you have to do it for methods. Uh, it's, it's only a very small, it's, it's less than 1% of the whole course, but it's, it's more of an advanced topic. Uh, don't attempt this unless you're like fairly decent already, unless it's on your sack. And Mitchie, I know it's probably going to be on your sack, so get to know this. Composite functions, what, what, what are they? I mean, how do you know that you're dealing with composite functions? Well, the, the first key that you know is when you have fog. And I don't mean that fog inside your brain. I mean this fog, f of g, or f of g of x. It looks like this, f of g of x, like that. Okay, that is exactly what composite functions are. So an ins a function inside of another function, it's like a pregnant woman, a little kid inside of a woman, <laughs> it's not funny. So fog, that is exactly what you have to deal with. And there's also the other case, which is GOF, which is G of F of that, right? You get, you get the drill. So fog and GOF, okay. Now some teachers call it F machine, G machine. I'm not gonna go so technical and so super duper machine talk with you. That's just gay. Anyhow, I'm just dropping my lids here. So this is what we're going to do. Okay. It's a very, I guess, simple concept, but uh, it can get a little complex if you don't know what you're doing. So the first thing I want to do is this f of x equals 2x. Okay. So very simple equation. f of x equals 2x. Now what happens if I go f of a? Well, any idiot would say it's 2a. Yes, it's very easy, right? What if I said f of z for Zeno? It's 2z. I know Zeno spelled with a z x, but that doesn't matter. Okay, so 2z it is. What if it was f of banana? Well, then it would be 2 banana, right? So you just replace the x with whatever is inside the brackets of the function of f. That's, that's it. So, what happens when you have g of x to, to be replaced? Well, you just replace it with g of x. So, give an example. f of x equals e to the power of x, g of x equals, uh, let's say, 4x. Well, to have fog, f of g of x, basically, f of x is still e x, so e, but now it's no e, there's no x because we're not dealing with x anymore, we're dealing with g of x, and g of x is 4x, and it's 4x, I know! It's brilliant. I'm starving. What about you? Okay, so that's how you go about doing that. That's how you go about doing that. And alternatively, goff, goff is going to be 4 but no x, it's going to be e to the power of x. Right? So that makes a lot of sense. But here is the real deal with composite functions. This is the easy stuff. This is the stuff like, mm, the real, uh, the real thing that you've got to calculate, the real thing that you've got to work out, that's to do with composite functions, is to know whether they exist or not. It's kind of like UFOs and aliens. Do they really exist? Do they not? There's a debate going on for thousands of years. But here's how you tell whether a composite function exists or not. You do one of these things. You do um, a little table, a little, you know, two by two table. But let's, let's just give you an example. f of x equals, let's say, e x minus 4. g of x equals um, x squared plus 1. For example, okay, very easy equations. Exponential and uh, parabola. Now, the first thing that I get all my method students to do um, is, is this, okay, you gotta know your transformations, but also you gotta be very good at graphing and knowing the domain and range. And I, I don't want you to just try and work out the domain range, I want you to get to a point where domain range becomes like, whoa, I know exactly what the domain range is. It's, it's, it's almost automatic. You, you wanna know the graph so well that it no longer becomes, oh, let me write this down, it becomes, you know, instant. So, what we gotta do here, good old funky, 
table thing. Okay, on top, it doesn't matter which way you go about it. Let's just put f of x here and g of x here. You've probably seen this in the textbooks. You know, it's very, very easy. And let me explain this. And this is domain range. And for those people out there, for those lovely individuals who don't, don't quite know domain range that well, get to know them. Okay, domain is the x, range is the y. And don't ever get that confused. Like x, y, x, y. You don't say y, x. Who says y, x? It's x, y, right? And domain range, it's domain range. It's not range domain. That's just awkward, right? So domain is always the x, range is always the y. Now, okay, so we got four boxes that we're going to fill. So we have to know the domain range for all these. And I want you to get to a point where you just go, boom, got it. Domain of f of x, r. Okay, range of f of x from negative 4. Does it ever touch negative 4? No, negative 4 to infinity. Boom, right? G of x, it's a parabola. We all know parabolas. Domain, r. Okay, that's a nice r. Kind of looks like a b. r. And the range of that, it's, does it touch 1? Yes, it does. One, positive 1 to infinity. Cool. All right, so we got those four boxes filled. That's your first step. You gotta do that. And don't try and skip any steps. Oh no, I got this information in my head. I stored it in my head. In, in my head. I store this information in my head. Doesn't happen. Don't rely on your memory. Your memory sucks. My memory sucks. Memories stink. Write, write shit down, okay? Now, to know whether it exists or not, to know whether it exists or not, okay? Here is what you must do. For fog, f of g of x to exist, okay, the range of g must fit in the domain of f. Okay, I'm going to repeat that again. The range of g must fit within the domain of f. Okay, I know it's a little, whoa, what did he just say? So it goes like this. There are diagonal arrows. So the range of g must fit, must fit inside the domain of F. Um, the technical word is a subset of, but who cares about technicalities anyway? Mathematicians do, I'm not one of them. So, that's how it works. Now, here's my question, is that range, is that, is that, uh, is that set of numbers a subset of R? Well, everything is a subset of R other than not R, <laughs> so not root numbers. So this is definitely a subset of R, and so therefore fog exists, and not just inside my brain, but inside it of uh, other people's brains too. Fog absolutely exists. Um, does Goff exist? The range of F, does that fit within the domain of G? Yes, absolutely it does, okay? So both of them exist. Both of them exist in this particular case. Now, that is the key. This is the key. So let's just change these things a little around a little bit, okay? So, let's say I change that. I change it to negative 4 to positive 2. Okay, does that fit in there now? No, no way. So it doesn't exist. That's it. It's simple, right? Does that make sense? I want you to get this. I really want you to get this. It's a simple concept. I know teachers fuck it up all the time, but you just have to, you know, keep watching and watch it again and stay with me here and do some questions afterwards. You've got to do the questions. So let's say if I had something like this. I had um, negative 4 and let's call it X. Oh no, let's call it A. Okay, let's call it A. So the question could ask you, hmm, what could A be? for fog to exist. What could A be for fog to exist? Think about this. Okay, this is from one to, and by the way, number lines, I love them. Let's draw a number line. Okay, here's one, and here's infinity. Like, yay. Well, how that has to fit in there. And negative four is all the way down here, negative four. So for this to be a subset of the whole thing, it has to go all the way to infinity. Does that make sense? So A has to be infinity in order for that to fit in there, or else it wouldn't fit. If that was a hundred billion, it still wouldn't fit because that's infinity. Does that make sense? Hope this is making sense. So this is more to do with the advanced questions, but most of the time you just have to get, say, hey, does it fit? 
is it a subset? If it is, it exists. If it isn't, it doesn't. Woo. So most of it comes down to your ability to actually extract the domain and range from the questions, from, from the functions, right? All right, I'm getting hungry talking. I'm gonna eat. Um, what else? That, that's pretty much all there is to it. And, and then to find the actual equations, you just get those two and put it together, right? Like what we did before. So for example, if I was to look for uh, fog, and by the way, I didn't explain why you do that. I mean, it, it's a bit silly. I don't think I need to. Um, so, so don't worry about it for now, but if you think about it, it, I, I, it really makes sense. If this isn't going to give you a value, it's not going to go in there. If it's, this result is never going to be, let's say, a certain value, this is never going to be negative 7, for example, right? Because we know that um, uh, this result is never going to be at negative 7 because it's a parabola and it's, you know, above the x-axis. That is never going to be a 7. Right. Does that make sense? It's that kind of concept. So think about that. But what I was going to say is to get the equation f of g of x, okay, simple. f is that e, but instead of x, you have that whole thing, minus 4. So replace the x with the g of x. That's it. So that's pretty much all there is to composite functions. As I said, it's only 1% of the whole course. So don't spend your entire life on it, okay? There are much better things to do, like parties and booze and etc. and girls, but know this for your SAT, know this for the exam, it's that 1% that's gonna make all the difference. Talk to you soon.